mass gang rapes, killings, including of babies and young children, brutal beatings, disappearances, Mosques and other and serious Muslim shops were burnt by Buddhist monks. More than half a million Rohingya Muslims have the now fled across the border. not recognize the Rohingya as a Rohingya group. This could be a genocide. The Rohingya people. Please don't kill me. Please don't kill me, please. Please don't kill me, please don't. Don't kill me! I want you guys to tell her to like, shut up, stop kicking. Okay. Don't swear. Can I go? Hey. Can I go like that? But scare her. So why did you do the plan? Just to tell the Buddhists to not do this bad stuff to our country. Have you ever acted before? No, this is the first time acting. The actor is drawing from their own stories, from their own history, from their own memories, from their own muscle memory, body memory. I was thinking like, this is my chance to show, show the people that there's still Rohingya existing. You have to make them live that story, because every single audience that's watching the story, it's not just watching it. We're making them live that story. I wasn't sure if the kids knew what they were getting themselves into. Are you gonna send us back to death? If we don't show Abba with my country, how can they all want to know? We have no discrimination to other religions. Don't believe it. It had all the hallmarks of ethnic cleansing. It was pretty harsh seeing your best friend die. You can't get that out of your head even after many years. I, wanna, I wanted them to join our play. Well, that could not happen because they're dead. What you're about to see is the story of my people. One by one, they try to erase Rohingya from existence. I remember starting to lose hope that this show could actually happen. Now it's just making people feel it. The sadness, the emotion, the horror, all of that stuff, just bring it out a little bit more. It can change the future for a lot of people. They can change what they see in the future. They won't see blood, they will see the sunset. Good morning and welcome to episode three of the ADHD podcast. I am your host, Mitch Bonacorso, and my co-host, Pat Greenall. This podcast is brought to you by the Canadian Development Rohingya Fund. On that note, it is my great honor to host co-founders Amadullah and Faisal Muhammad. Ahmed and Faisal are one of my inspirations as they continue to advocate for the Rohingya peoples and have had much success. Today we're going to be talking about the Rohingya crisis and uh, to provide a brief background, uh, since 1978 the Rohingya, a Muslim minority of Western Burma, have been subject to a state-sponsored process of destruction. Amin and Faisal, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. Now, you have been advocating. I met you, Ahmed, at the premiere at McMaster of the film I Am Rohingya. Uh, and in this film, uh, you reenacted with fellow refugees. You reenacted um, kind of the crisis going on in Myanmar. Um, and you've since premiered this film in a wide variety of locations, um, primarily uh, coming out of Kitchener. And that's where the film was uh, filmed. Um, what are your thoughts on this? You've been advocating this for years. And, and, and I'm so interested in your story, Ahmed, because despite all your successes, despite all your adversity that you have overcame, you continue to advocate for this topic. How do you do that? I mean, it's not easy, right? Like, when you're trying to fight for something people don't even really know about, um, trying to fight a genocide, slow burning genocide that's been happening against the Rohingya people for, for four decades now. So in a world stage, it could be hard, but for me personally is when I came to this country, I was given a chance. I was given a chance to start fresh and given also a voice. And when you're given a voice and the voice here, when you speak, people listen. And there's so many great, caring Canadian people that are willing to listen. Why waste that talent? Or why waste that God-gifted gift that God gave you and brought you to this country to speak for other people? Why waste that chance and do nothing about it? So that's why 
we gathered together, like, you know, for the film. It was, it was never our intention to make a film, but it was a theatrical production that we, we came up with all the kids, 14 of us, and we wrote a script and it followed through. Like, it took us years because we didn't have any acting experience. After, we just really mu pretty much just went on the stage and did a, did a show and having a sold out show that 450 people came out to, like the first wow. show that gave us the motivation to continue what we do. Then we did another show selling out $35,000 in ticket, literally, mm -hmm. and for 950 people. Mm -hmm. So when you have so many people are willing to take the time and want to come out and support you, mm -hmm. how do you give up? How do you abandon that? Mm -hmm. When people are willing to give hope, mm -hmm. even when they don't know about the crisis. So that's what pretty much pushed, pushed me and the other you to do something for this crisis. Awesome, Ahmed. Well, th once again, thank you guys so much for coming by and talking. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, how would you sum up this crisis primarily in Myanmar? Um, and how would you sum up the, the destruction that is ongoing to someone who has no idea what's going on? It's a systematic, systematic plan that's, that's been taking place for the past 40 years. And and the world is pretty much failing to act up on it. You know, mm -hmm. when Rwanda was happening, the whole world was regard, uh, regretting that they couldn't do anything to stop it. And they said never again. That was the slogan that was used everywhere. Mm -hmm. And there is a genocide happening against the Rohingya minorities. You know, then the, pretty much the world has been silent. Like to me, any of you who are watching or listening, don't get me wrong. You know, when a Muslim person does something wrong, you will hear it every single headline, every single news channel will podcast that. And when there's something bad is happening against the Rohingya Muslims, like Muslim people in particular, mm -hmm. the world is pretty much silent. Mm -hmm. silent. So mm -hmm. it's, it's ignorant in, in mm -hmm. a way. Uh, I don't mean to say everyone's ignorant. There are many great people and there's hundreds of thousands of people that are doing something about it, but also, we're not doing enough to stop a genocide that's happening in our backyard because it's still going on. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any kind of efficient way of going about acting on something like this? I don't know. Okay. Could you, could you, like, if you don't mind? So, talking about it is obviously great, and we can bring awareness, and we can always do that. But do you think that there's any kind of more forward-moving way of helping the people out? Making a difference. Mm-hmm. So um, when you're doing acting versus like going, telling your story in public, acting people, people love theater productions. People love seeing things on the scene. Okay. When, pe excuse me, when people are watching things, mm. they can feel the emotion. Mm -hmm. Right. Versus talking about it. Yes, there's more than we can do because we can condemn, we can get our government to condemn the violence against the Rohingyas. Right. To yeah. make sure that, that all the government or like-minded countries like mm -hmm. Canada are doing something about it because they need mm -hmm. our help as human beings, not because it is our responsibility to protect, mm -hmm. but it is also a matter of humanity crisis. Like it's, it's, it's not the attack is, right now that's happening. That's not against Rohingyas or Muslims. Mm -hmm. It's against humanity. These people are being attacked because of their religion, because of their skin color. And I don't think that's, that's a fair solution to to, to, to these Rohingyas because you're trying to get rid of them because the, of the faith they practice and the mm -hmm. religion and, the, and, and their skin color. I don't think that's the right way to go of about course. it. Yeah, yeah, th th that's so true. And speaking about responsibility to protect and the international community's involvement, would you say there's any updates on, on where we sit in terms of, uh, is there any countries that have not classified as a genocide? I believe the this America... They said that it was, uh, so there's um, a huge conversation about regarding it as an ethnic cleansing. And let, let it be clear, this is not ethnic cleansing, this is a genocide. And, and you, you often refer to it as a slow-burning genocide, but I think it's most important that people understand it is a genocide outright. Um, and, and this is similar to uh, our, our Canadian experiences with the Aboriginals. And, and, and it's a, it, as you addressed, it's, it's a political situation where we have people who unfortunately came across a mass amounts of power and are classifying these things for political interest. Um, you have people saying that um, in Myanmar, you have politicians referring to the Rohingya as, uh, as carp, 
um, similar to how they, they treated the Tutsis in Rwanda, as you were addressing. Um, is there any countries that have yet to, to come out and say, has Canada said that it was a genocide? And, and how is your relationship with dealing? Ahmed has a, a pretty extensive experience working with um, diplomats in Canada and abroad um, and, and speaking to them about the crisis. If you look officially, pretty much only two countries did call it genocide. Mm-hmm. And I am ge- grateful and thankful that Canada was the first country to officially oh, wow. call it genocide. And United States, actually two weeks ago, uh, Bill 1081, uh, I might be wrong with the number, Bill 1081, it was passed um, in, in the Senate, uh, calling it, declaring it, uh, what was happening against the Rohingyas was a genocide. And a lot of people don't want to mention that it's a genocide because uh, R2P comes in it, responsibility to protect. That, that's a big thing. When a country calls a genocide, then the matter gets bigger and bigger and bigger. More people involved in it, more, more money people, involved. More yeah. money involved. And not, not many countries want to do that. And Canada contributed $300 million for the next four years. And, mm-hmm. and for a small country, not in land, land-wise, with the population, donating $300 million for a crisis. It's huge. That's, that's a huge thing, you know? So Canada is doing pretty good with it. And I, I think the world needs to look at Canada mm-hmm. and follow their lead because mm. I think Canada, they're kind of slow with things, you know? But also you got you to gotta be mindful that there's a lot of things going on with the Canadian, or, or the Canadian thing because there's NAFTA deals going on. There's like a bunch of other crises that's going on within our own country here in Canada. But still, the government is so committed and, and are trying so hard to, to bring peace for the Rohingyas. But it's lacking leadership mm-hmm. with other countries. You know, Canada needs to step up and say, hey, we get a lead, we get an idea. Let's sit down at a table and discuss what we could do for these Rohingyas. Instead of just talking or tweeting, you know, that mm-hmm. doesn't help people. Mm-hmm. Because if there's people still in a refugee camp, that means the crisis has not stopped. And there's people been there for the past 38, uh, 30 years. Mm-hmm. And this needs to stop because these uh, leaders are not mindful of one thing. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, I was born in that camp, mm-hmm. in one of those camps in Bangladesh. Mm-hmm. And when kids are born in a refugee camp there, they're not, they don't even have proper education. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was there last month, I was shocked, you know. I, I was thinking to thinking myself that how was I from this place here, but yet I'm treated so differently. Mm-hmm. When you have a Canadian passport, people world treats you so much respect. You know, nobody wants to lay a finger on you. Mm-hmm. Then there's my brothers and sisters in the camp. They're not getting the same respect. Even when they want to come talk to me, you will see that they're being watched, mm-hmm. and that's that's crazy. And then, and the world need to do something about this because you know what? No human, regardless of Rohingya, Muslims or brown people, whatever, whoever they are, mm-hmm. nobody should live like that. Nobody deserves to live like that because I saw kids eating mud. Kids are playing with a sword water. And I'm pretty sure nobody here in Canada would allow their kids to eat mud and play with the sword water. No, sword water. I'm sorry, I could pronounce it wrong, but I don't think anybody would be okay with that, you know? No, definitely. Mitch and I were actually discussing, we're pretty fascinated with the uh, with the camps in general. Uh, do you have any memories from the camp uh, specifically that, you know, kind of hit home for you? You know, I'm very grateful and thankful that I'm no longer in that place. Mm. You know, I still literally still have nightmares about that place because... Living in a refugee camp, waiting for your world food program to give you food, pretty much not even enough to survive off. Mm-hmm. And being hungry and you can't leave the camp, you know. Here, Faisal's father, you know, Faisal's father, my father, they, they used to go out into into the sea, you know, to go fish and stuff. You know, they come back a few months after with the money and people are getting robbed by Bengalis, you know. They're saying, hey, you're illegal, illegal here. And you're this and that. You're working and you're making money off of us. And then these people don't even have basic human rights. So, excuse me. 
This is gonna be edited, right? Uh, not necessarily, but that's cool. I don't, I don't mind things like that. It's okay, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, when you can't live, live like you know, it's a small place. It's like a like university campus. Some university campus are bigger than the refugee camp. Mm. When you can't exit or come in and come out. How, what what kind of thing is that? Like you know, you can't even leave that right. same area. You're seeing the same thing repeat yeah. for 27 years, 30 years of your life, like right. in a crowd in a small place. And right, is there people guarding the camps and and enforcing certain things like that as well? Yeah, so the to make sure you can't escape or you know, like making sure you get a certain amount of food or not getting a certain amount of food. I guess the food one is, you know, they have. Bengali kids, you know, like who recently graduated. Could you help us understand the Bengali? I Bengalis are people of Bangladesh. Oh, okay. So, so they're they're called Bengalis. Is it Bangladeshi people to say that term? Bengali? No, no, no. Bengali is oh, okay. no, no, no. Okay. It's, it's the, their uh, their their race. Right. Oh, okay. So South, yeah. As their opposed culture. to Burmese. Or? Yeah, Burmese Bengalis are oh, okay. people of Bangladesh. Okay. Or you can say Bangladesh or Bengali. Cool. Thank you. Mm. So, so Bengalis. Uh, they have kids who has no experience with, with this crisis or anything and they're working, you know, they're young and they, I saw with my own eyes, you know, when I was in my recent trip, I was seeing that these kids are abusing the Rohingyas, you know, when, mm. when people are waiting in line to get their food and they're, you know, they're not being treated as people like the culture that I come from, most Bengali people that I know are very respectful. We never push our elders. We never shout at our elders. We never say, like, you know, speak in a, in a rude manner with mm. our elders. When I seen those refugees waiting in, in line for food and the way they were being treated by these, these Bengali kids, it's, it burns my skin, you know? Yeah. It, it literally gets into under my skin and, and, and pretty much I can't, I can't really do anything about mm. it. Yeah. That's definitely tough. One of the one of my favorite um, components of our panel that we had at McMaster of the premiere of the I Am Rohingya film directed by Yusuf Zine was when um, an individual asked you, or I would I would say called you out about your comment that uh, some money is slipping through the cracks. And once again, uh, to be frank, this is why I envy you because your ability to overcome that adversity and say things like they are because. As an outsider, I do believe that money likely is falling through the cracks. Um, a, a whole other story, uh, uh, my girlfriend and I, uh, we raised uh, $3,000 for uh, the MS Society. Um, and it, it came to our knowledge down the road that 80% uh, goes to salaries, uh, which is very disappointing when, when you raise that amount of money. Um, what is your experience like when it comes to the humanitarian efforts in, in terms of the monetary amounts? And um, could you maybe uh, explain... The, the politics behind that yeah sure so you see let me let me start off with a personal story for me a lot of people has given me personal check for the work i do because mm. sometimes it could be hard for a young person to be traveling the world without a single dollar funds in their pocket but it's still Advocating. i refuse it i refuse to take that money i rather beg my friends and family to pay for or help me pay for my plane ticket versus taking money from someone you know, I always have the thought in my head that what if I accidentally spend that one cent on me? What if I accidentally spent a dollar on me? Then that burden will lie with me for the rest of my life. That dollar could have win to help at least five or ten kids there to get food. You know, dollar is nothing for us here. Coffee costs two dollars. And if you go to Starbucks, it costs you five dollars. To us, it's nothing. To them, you can literally live off. You could literally live off of five dollar for for a week there, you know. So that's why we don't. I, I personally don't accept money from people. So now let me tell you what's happening with the organizations. You know when you see kids hungry and people are being raped and men being slaughtered and there's like thirty, forty thousand minors. As Canadians, we're humans. Mm -hmm. We have a very, very soft spot for humanitarian crisis. Mm -hmm. Anybody who sees vulnerable pictures, everybody wants to donate. Yeah. Here's my checkbook, take thousands of dollars. Raising that $3,000 with your girlfriend, that was not easy. Mm -hmm. You know why? 
it's very hard to raise money for things that people don't know about. Mm -hmm. Especially being a university student and being at such a young age, mm -hmm. people will be like, oh, this kid's probably like, we don't even know where the money's gonna be going. Mm. Then there's big organizations. I personally have helped out raising hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. And they, they have promised me that they'll be using the funds for Rohingyas. When you go there, all these organizations that you helped out, none of them exist. You know, I wanted to cry out of anger how, manipula how manipulated I was helping these organizations raise millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. But when I was there, I don't see any of it. Mm -hmm. And all these people are coming to me for help. And, and, and what am I supposed to do? How many people can I help when I'm giving someone 100 taka and there's 50 other people lining up and, mm -hmm. and the people just add stuff and add stuff and I can't give anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen this one-year-old girl, probably not even one, eating mud. You think, as a human being, you, think, you don't think I want to help? Mm -hmm. So that's why, for me, I have the biggest critic of people raising money and not getting the funds there. You know, I understand you have an organization to run. Mm -hmm. But tell that to people that you're going to be using certain of, of the money towards your salary. Mm -hmm. If your salary is bigger than the cause, then what's the point of having the organization? What's the purpose? Facts. If you're for every hundred dollar, if you're using eighty dollar for your staff and using twenty dollar for the Rohingyas, and by the time you get there, you barely get two dollar. Rohingyas barely gets two dollar mm -hmm. because this organization partners up with the other organizations, and the money splits up. Yeah. And the government money that that are going in, for example, the three hundred million dollars that will be going into Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. I was happy that Canada gave it. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I'm not happy how the money is being distributed mm -hmm. or will be distributed because the money was not sent yet. Mm -hmm. These funds will be going to Bangladeshi government and Bangladeshi will send it to uh, provincial government. Then mm. it will go to municipal. Municipal sends it to organizations. A lot of filters. And, you know, I'm grateful that Bangladesh has let us stay there. But country is very corrupted. And it's going through that. You know, it, it, it's the most corrupt country that I have been personally. And I lived in it. So when you have things like that, we have to be mindful of where our dollars are going, you know. Mm. Every single Canadian person or the person that lives in Canada could raise this question. Mm -hmm. I donated that money. Mm -hmm. could say that and, and then ask this question, where's my money going? Mm -hmm. We should be more questionable towards where our monies are going. 100%. Excuse me. We've got we to gotta ask the questions when we're donating our money. We've got to be like, did the money get there? We have, there should be follow-ups. Mm -hmm. We give money, the problem doesn't yeah. stop. Where's the proof? Where's the proof that the yeah. money has been distributed? You know, average person, uh, what do you call this? This is uh, spoken by Bill Gates. Average person makes a million dollars in their lifetime. But this is what the world population averaged out. And there is more than one billion dollar has been donated towards Rohingya cause. More than a billion dollar. And yet, these people are shortage of food. And isn't it crazy, like, when they send a Canadian dollar and they get $65 in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. and yet people are short of food. Yeah. Yet people are eating mud. And can you tell me if this organization, sorry if I'm taking too long no, to answer this all. question, yeah. but if you donate in hundreds of millions of dollars and if people are still starving and you don't need hundreds of millions of dollars to feed these people, can you tell me if they're doing their job or not? Can you tell me that they're doing, you find the most vulnerable picture out there. You find, you do a, such an amazing photo op that people want to donate every single penny they have. Mm -hmm. And yet, the people that they want to help is not getting the help. Mm. The money's just not getting there. Yeah. We need to find a way to be, we need to find a way to hold these people accountable mm. for things they're doing. Because they need to know that if someone's watching, because personally, I have family there. Mm -hmm. My aunt and uncle and their kids, they're all there right now still. Mm. And if they're asking me for money and I'm so fighting, we are fighting. I'm fighting and the whole community is fighting to get money there. You know, fighting to make sure that people are donating money. And yet, my family is calling me and saying, hey, we're not getting any food. H how am I supposed to respond to that? And, and you know, when I'm there, when someone asks you for your WhatsApp number, how do you say no to that? Mm -hmm. When I give them out, everybody's crying to me and telling me every night I'm having personal nightmares because I have to hear this. 
So you're getting messages on WhatsApp from people in the camps? Yeah, WhatsApp, Facebook, you know, wow. IMO, that's, uh, IMO is the thing they, like, that they use. It's like right. WhatsApp. Okay, okay, yeah. And you can do video calls. Mm -hmm. And I can go through my phone and show you hundreds of messages, people begging me for help and, and telling me that they don't have food. And yeah, I don't know how to even respond to that. Have you ever asked any of the organizations that you've worked with, like, hey, look, like, I'm talking to my family. They're not getting food. Where is this money going? Have you ever asked and have they ever given you any kind of legitimate response? <laughs> not one time. I have literally spoke about them on TV shows and in interviews and radio interviews. And, you know, when you're helping them raise money, you're someone important. When you're calling them out, you're just un uneducated illiterate mm. who just talking nonsense. Mm. Facts. You see, the thing is, my credibility will never be as big as theirs because their organization. They could be doing something good in other region versus doing something in Rohingya camp. Mm -hmm. That's my experience of seeing because that's a crisis I'm fighting. I cannot talk about Yemen or Syria or, or Palestine because that's not what I've been focused on my life. I haven't lived that right. experience to talk about that, you For know, sure. to see. So this organization, there's actually a lot of organizations that do collect money in the name of Rohingya but helps out somewhere else because they're legally banned in Bangladesh. Bangladesh is not easy with countries coming in or uh, organizations coming in because they like to be in control. Mm -hmm. When organizations bring money, they don't have as much as the government does. Mm -hmm. They have no control over that. So that's why when I raise the question, they tell me, let's meet. And when we do go in a meeting, I take my team, Faisal here, mm -hmm. and Saiful and Farid, we're four co-founders of the organization. We all go in. Mm -hmm. We don't go alone in the meeting because we want to hear what they have to say. And in these meetings, do you find like they do they progress? Do they go anywhere? Like, do they give you any kind of real feedback as far as this is the answer I get? You know, as Muslims, we, we call each other brothers mm -hmm. and I do that to my non-Muslim brothers, too. Mm -hmm. This is the thing they say, brother, we're trying. That's it. That's the only answer I get. And I have seen. When I was in Bangladesh, someone posted a link on my Facebook and saying, hey, there's, gonna, there's an organization was $50 in their, fund, uh, their bank account that needs help. Then they sent a screenshot of the bank account. They were such a fool to send me the whole screenshot of the whole fund, financial things going in. And the balance was not $50. It was $50,000. And they were posting because there's a lot of rich people that follows what I'm doing mm -hmm. and they want to donate. And people personally that I know, when they want to donate to events, I tell them don't donate. If you want to donate, find a Rohingya in the camp, mm. give the money to them. Then you know the money is actually going to the Rohingyas versus you as giving to these as organizations. Right. Well, I was actually just wondering too, like as far as the average person, what would you urge the average person to do? Because now, like you said, donating technically, if the money's not going to properly get to the people. Um, you, so you, you'd urge people to reach out to the people in the camps directly. Is there anything else as far as like what the average person can do to help? Money is not going to help them. Okay. So I'm not saying don't donate hmm. because they will still need food. But, you know, when I interviewed, I actually interviewed hundreds of people when I was there. Only one question they rose, they rose to me, that they, they brought up, sorry, to me was we want to be educated. Yeah. They want to go to school. You know, there's 50 kids out of 1.2 million people mm -hmm. are qualified to go to university because none of the other people went to school. And the woman I went with, her name is Eureka Sumit, and her and I, we asked the same qu we asked a question to them. We asked them a question, which, which was, why only 50 people out of 1.2 million people are qualified enough to go to university? Their answer was, we had from the Bangladeshi government, they don't want us to be educated. Yes. When everybody goes to sleep, we go study. Yeah. We have private tutors come in and things like that. In We're qualified dark. enough. And when I see these kids are speaking in English, I swear their grammars and, and their, their intelligence is much higher than mine. I was, I was shocked myself. I the was motivation like, is just... Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, these kids were telling me what they want to be in the future. I swear to God, I was so ashamed of myself. You know, I tell myself I would do this and I would do that. Compared to those kids, I am nobody. 
Mm. I am just an ungrateful kid who was just brought to Canada and just doing a little bit of something to fight for his people. You know, these kids that they were telling me they want to be lawyers and they want to be this and that. They are working day and night. And day and night, they're teaching whatever they know, whatever they have learned to other kids. Mm-hmm. When you see such thing, community are educating. Let me, t- let me share this, uh, another story. I interview uh, two teachers who finished grade eight only, and they have 250 students in their school. And the school is not funded by anyone because when it's funded by every, uh, a government organization, they cannot teach Bangla, mm-hmm. the local Bangladeshi long- local language. So, but the kids want to learn that. How do you get around by not lo- knowing the local language, you know? How do you, how do you communicate? So, at the end of the day, they wanted to be educated. And I asked the teachers, are you qualified to teach? I was like, and they told me they're not qualified, but they had no other solution because nobody would give them the education that they need. So, whatever they know, they passed it on. And every person that we interview, it was in English. And that was, that was the craziest thing. I never thought the Rohingya people would speak English outside the ones who lives in abroad. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was amazed. So to go back to the question, please reach out to your government. Like mm-hmm. if you're in Canada, reach out to the Canadian government. If you're an American, reach out to the American government, wherever you live in the world, you know, write a handwritten letter. Mm-hmm. Let's not send an email because, you know, even I personally don't check most of my emails, you know. I got mm-hmm. hundreds of them every day. Yeah. If you write a handwritten letter, then they know that you took your time. Then you actually mean something. Mm-hmm. Then they will have to open it and they have to respond to you. Mm-hmm. Right. So most likely, like, only way you can help this is condemn to stop this violence. Yeah, that's that's super great um and on that note for more information please visit rohingya.ca that is uh ahmed and faisal's website for more information um to contextualize this hatred um stemming from the myanmar uh, military-led government um and and the several buddhist insurgents um the literature on this topic is lower than what i expected uh, being uh, in the industry um y- you have uh, a lot of quotes from the Rohingyan refugees themselves that I found interesting, such as, uh, we Rohingyas are like birds in a cage. However, caged birds are fed while we have to struggle alone to feed ourselves. Um, if we aren't Burmese, who are we? Um, and our future has been spoiled, but what will happen to the future of our children? That is my question to the humanitarian organizations. So um, th- this all being said, the hatred stemming from the government and the Buddhist insurgents is a little bit difficult to understand because that's what I wanted to convey to the general audience is how did this hatred begin? And it's pretty difficult to analyze from the outside, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And I thought that it was pretty similar to, say, how Canada has viewed the Aboriginal population in the sense that you have Myanmar politicians saying the Rohingya are a colonial primitive community. Um, to address these troll comments, say on Reddit, the, the, some people that, uh, mind you, are downvoted say um, they are illegals hiding on Burmese land. They are being peacefully removed, which we know is ridiculous by the government. And the quote leftist media is lying and defending radical Islam like they always do. Um, obviously, these are unsubstantiated claims. Um, we also have like once again downvoted comments um, saying that you know m- militant Rohingyas have been slaughtering Hindus. In Burma for a while um, so I, I looked into this topic and you definitely see a lot of literature that suggests that's not true and if it is true it's on a scale so you definitely have particular instances where there's um, I, I believe it's called the Rohingya Patriotic Front what are your guys experiences on don't get me wrong it, it is a my conviction that I am 100% sold that this is an ongoing genocide against the Rohingya peoples how do we re- how do we refute these claims by uneducated people who make the claim that the Rohingya are these colonial type that are trying to invade the land um, that they I, I believe there was a story that came out that they took over a police station for a while and my opinion is that this is all on a scale and the the the, the overarching scale is that the Rohingyas are being slaughtered systemically and yes there may be some instances where the Rohingya 
they take their matters into their own hands. What is your experience with that? And when you do you encounter often Rohingyas who say, you know, I want to get into power and eliminate all of Myanmar or, or, or what is your what are your thoughts on, on, on some of the more aggressive um, uh, people in that in, in that sense? You know, I'm not going to deny it. Some of those people are right. Rohingyas did take over police posts. But ask me, how did they take over the police force? Yeah, with knives. Not even knife. If they had knife, then there would be something. Yeah, right. You know, this is the one thing people don't really know. is that if I'm raping your mother, your sister, your daughter, and slaughtering you in front of your whole family, and tossing your kid into life burning fire, which human in this world would not have the urge to attack or to rebel in any sense really yes yeah you know the thing is no matter what in life you'll find illiterate you'll find people who are just ignoring mm -hmm. who just has nothing better to do with their life than talk crap about something about something that we should be trying to stop versus actually trolling them you know, even me personally, I have, I go through it alone. Like, you know, when, go read any of my news article and tell me if there's no negative comments. People tell me to go back to my country. Yeah. You know what I tell them? I am back in my country. This is my country. Mm -hmm. I yes. hold a Canadian passport and your Canadian passport, it says you're Canadian. Mine, it says the same thing. Yep. Yeah. So if you're telling me to go back, you should go back. Like you mentioned, you know, and it's the land of the indigenous people. This is not any Canadian cannot truly claim except the indigenous people that this is their home. Facts. This is my home as much as theirs. And it is also like it goes both way. Yep. Mm. We took they took the land from the indigenous people. I don't know the history that much. I won't go deep into it. Mm. But if you really know it, then that's how it goes. Right. Yep. So these people also you have to you have to be mindful of the things is the things that they're saying. The Burmese government has hacked many, many Facebook accounts, the generals, the top people, and Facebook has released that themselves that they couldn't do enough to stop it. Yeah. So how do we know that it's actually a real person rather than a Burmese government just putting the things there to change people's perspective? Mm. You know, when you see Buddhists, you think of peaceful people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And majority of them are. I'm not going to deny that. And there's lots of Buddhists in Myanmar who wants to condemn the violence too. They went out and they have protested. Where do you think the separation is? The separation is started when the British, uh, when the Japanese was attacking Myanmar against the British, when British was in power. The colonials, yes, you're right. The Rohingyas were involved in colonialism because they were fighting with the British because the British promised us our own land and the Japanese promised uh, the, the thing to fight. And Rohingyas, they were on an equal battlefield. They both had weapons on both sides. And Rohingyas fought with the British Empire. And the Burmese fought with the, with the, with the Japanese, uh, alongside with the Japanese. So after they lost, they have this hatred for Rohingyas. Mm -hmm. You know, it's written in their textbook. The Rohingyas are the reasons this would happen. And... Those kids who were young at the time, that's what their parents taught them. And now they're old. Mm -hmm. They're like 30, 40. And they're teaching in their schools. Rohingyas are the, you know, when you think about North Koreans and Americans, I want to give an, like, a scenario. All they know is propaganda. America is this and that. Yes, there's some truth to it. But right. not everything they're being uh -huh. taught is the truth because it's only one side of the story they're being told. If you want people to know both sides of the story, you've got to represent both sides of the story. And, and, and America cannot present his case there. Mm. Only whatever is the leader of North Korea is teaching them about, my, um, about, North, uh, sorry, about America is what they're learning. It's the same thing there. So that's where the kids are being taught. And that's where the separation has started. And one top diplomat, a uh, Burmese diplomat uh, ambassador to, to the Hong Kong, he said the Rohingyas are as ugly as ogres. They see our skin color as a disgrace, and they see our religion as a disgrace. So also it goes back to religion. And also, end of the day, you got to be mindful that this is also a business too. Yes. 
there is rich minerals in the lands the Rohingyas are staying. And how do you get rid of people? I was wondering if there was also yeah. something in the back end there as far as like value that, that maybe the government was looking for. In terms of resources. Whether it be yeah, oil resources. or something. Or and does that contribute to why the international community doesn't condemn it? Or that's is the it international is, yes. community exactly. interested in resources or business? So China is involved in it. Mm. China is India is two super cow- uh, superpowers mm. or super cowards, I would say, in my own terms, mm. are back in Myanmar up and denying everything that's happening. When you have two cowards with superpower and... How can when you deny that kind of hard evidence, though? When you see videos, uh, Mitch showed me a video of a police officer, police officer smoking a cigarette while people. people were getting lashed. And uh, when you see videos like that come out, how do you deny like the hard evidence, especially as like a full superpower? Mm-hmm. How do you just say, oh, no, not existing? Like, oh, no, it's not, <laughs> not simply just not happening. Like how, yeah, like how do you even deny that? It's just wild. Not everybody is Canadian. You see, we make a mistake here. Even if it's not our own mistake, someone else make a mistake, we say sorry for it. Right. You know, that's the thing. When a country, even like China, they were all close to the whole world until like 1988. Mm. Sorry, eight, uh, yeah, 1988. That's when they opened up to the world. Mm-hmm. End of the day, also, you, there's a lot of propaganda even going on in, 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 in the thing. People has hatred for Muslim people. I mm. don't mean to make this thing about religion, but but it's a part of it. Yeah, th- there's there's a thing right now, the concentration camp thing happening in China itself, but against the Muslims, yeah. and India. There's they're changing the name, like you know, there was a city named Ahmedabad, uh, no Allahabad, sorry, mm. and it was a uh, like you know, they changing everything. Like there's so much hatred from world leaders now for Muslim people, that they wanna you know. They want to they want to find a way to get rid of you know mm-hmm. and you see the thing is america is the i thought in my opinion i thought america was the country that hated everybody mm-hmm. but even america is speaking against under trump administration mm-hmm. when he says the man repeats america first every single sentence he says america first make america great again and if Trump administration is willing to help, yeah. now you got to know where these people stand. Right. So an American can't do anything alone. How can you, one superpower, go against two superpower? And also, you have to be mindful, you know, like, I'm not good with history, but I know as much as I know, if America involves and attacks something and Russia will be against it, everybody will pick a side and go against America. So that's why mm. it's bigger politics involved. And also the whole world is silent also because they're like I said earlier, there's rich minerals in, in, in Rak- uh, Arkan, which is Rakhine now, that people don't want to close off their business to Myanmar. Mm, yeah. They, they, if they say something, then they'll be like, God damn, we're yeah, out of it And now. there goes the money. Yeah. Good morning. Yeah. Let's address the, another contrarian comment about saying that uh, the Rohingya uh, Muslims... Um, do you think any of them are aligned with the jihad group? So I read something that um, Al Qaeda has released a statement saying that that everyone needs to do their part in uh, helping the the Muslims in Myanmar, um, and that and, and there's some trolls that say that the Rohingya are, are, are similar to the Sharia law, um, and, and they advocate for that. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on on the Rohingya's um, position uh, as a Muslim? You know, if Rohingyas wanted revenge, they wouldn't have fled. That's, that's the only simple way I could answer this question. You know, if Rohingyas wanted to retaliate against the Burmese government, I don't think they would be suffering in a refugee camp right now. And let me tell you this. The Rohingya people once were the richest people in Myanmar. Mm-hmm. And also, if you look around, the top, top businessmen in Myanmar who do not claim, self, them, uh, who do not claim themselves as Rohingyas right now because of the crisis is also a Rohingya. Mm-hmm. If they wanted to retaliate, I swear to God, there is a way to get the resource in the, in the thing. You know, that's the thing. You know, a lot of people have told this to me. Rohingyas are true representative Muslims. Mm. You know, we don't want to retaliate. We do not think that violence is going to solve anything. Mm-hmm. You know, matter of fact, I don't want to be hypocritical. There is a group called ARSA, 
uh, Arkansas Salvation Army. Mm -hmm. So what they did, they, they, there's people who was brought up in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Rohingyas, who was born in Saudi Arabia when their parents fled. Mm -hmm. And they went back, they want to retaliate. That's why they did kill a few police, post and police officers and things like that. That does not justify that you make... 720,000 people flee overnight. A head for an eye. Th that does not justify yeah. why you attack an innocent civilian. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, if I hurt you, you come after me. You don't go after my family. Mm -hmm. My family has nothing to do with this. Mm -hmm. So that's what it is. Because of five guys with like two, two, three, four, eighty, AK-47 attacked a police check post and all you do is like launch missiles. Yeah. That, that's, that's, that's how you get them and you didn't even get the people. And you know what's the funny thing? And the Rohingyas themselves don't even support this group. Mm -hmm. You know, when you ask me, I think they're terrorists. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you know why? We're trying to show the world that we're innocent. Mm -hmm. And you see these five stupid fools are showing the yeah, opposite yeah. of it. Just and it discredits everything we say or do. Bad rep. So that's why even here in, in Rohingyas in Canada, they say no. Mm -hmm. If anybody asks for support and things like that, no. You know, we have the right way of doing this thing and to do it. You know, it's crazy. You know, let me let me share something with that. You know, they even the people and there is certain people I get trolled that thinks that I want to retaliate against the Burmese government. You know, my team is being I'm not supposed to say this, but I'm still going to say it. We're being investigated by federal agents, federal mm -hmm. intelligence. They think that we are because being Muslims, as soon as we want to speak up for something, they think we're terrorists. Mm. They showed up to my house, the federal in investigation team, and I can get you their contact information to source, uh, prove this, you know? They showed up to my house without even telling me and said, we need to talk to Ahmed. And my mom got freaked out. My mom don't speak English. When you show her a badge, she, she probably thought I did something wrong. Mm. Yeah, traumatized. And they called me. I don't know how they found my contact information, and they... And should be every single one in my team. And asking me questions like, are you associated with Pakistanis? Are you associated with Muslim Student Association? Uh, were you ever thinking about retaliating? Do you ever have the thought of going killing someone? I was like, like I, I want to control my language right yeah. now. Like, you know, I don't want to say it. Yeah, that's tough, man. Why any time a Muslim person wants to make a difference is the weird thinking about retaliating? Mm -hmm. I, this is what I repeated constantly. Rohingyas do not support terrorism. Rohingyas do not want to uh, retaliate. Mm -hmm. I do not want to retaliate. I do not want anyone to retaliate. We just want to go home. We just want our citizenship right back. And we just want to live in peace and harmony. That's what we want. We don't want any of the violence. We don't want eye for an eye. They did so many things to us. We don't want that back. Just let us go back to our country and let us live in our own little land and in our little own world. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to bother you. Just don't bother us. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds reasonable to me. It's crazy that such a simple concept like that gets politicized, gets and so blown over. It's and, just and, like, and it's, it's, it, I, I'm, I can't believe that that happened. Part of me is not surprised given how the world works and how our right. security agencies work. But that was my one takeaway when I did watch your premiere, when I watched, uh, I am Rohingya, one of the the feelings that I had, and I, and I wrote about this in, in my blog post, the feelings I had was <clears throat> with some of my family in the military and, and things like that, m my thoughts were, you know, like, let's get some boots on the ground and let's just clear out the, the Myanmar government. But then I thought, you know, right back to your teachings in the film's message, we can't do that, that boots on the ground are not going to help. The responsibility to protect, maybe we can figure something, a happy medium, but violence isn't going to, to help the situation. Um, and, and the fact that, that you're getting investigated or, or you know, your, your integrity is being questioned after so much of your content is out on the internet is public access where your claims, in my opinion, are extremely clear. That's tough. So I, I, I really envy your ability to continue to, to, to do that. I'll show you a message after the interview is done. Mm -hmm. You know, the funny thing is, they randomly shoot me a text after they met me in person. They showed up to my school and they said, they gave me 10 minute notice. It was like, we need to meet now. 
And I was like, I have to go write an exam. Yeah. I have to go write a midterm. You know, so I got back from Bangladesh. And mm-hmm. right after I hop off the plane, I go write my, uh, mm-hmm. my midterm. And next thing I know, I have a federal investigator waiting outside of my school. They can't be in the property. Mm-hmm. They were waiting. They were like, I'm by your school out of Tim Horton. Can you meet? What? And so you've, you've had a couple run-ins then. They were constantly following me. They're keeping track of what I post on my social media. And they shoot me a text and say, hey, how, how was your exam? And letting me know that they're still watching me. You know, it's crazy. When I want to make a difference. Whoa. But the thing is, my skin color and my religion does not, does not make me a person who wants to help. It makes me a person who wants to retaliate. You know, someday I will change that. I don't, I don't believe that hatred is going to change how I think, you know, this country has given me something that nothing, nobody have ever given to me or any country gave me a life, gave me a voice. Mm-hmm. You know, as long as you have those two, nobody in this world can shut me down. Like, you know, when I was in that refugee camp, all I wanted was people to take me as a person. I wanted to go to school. That was a dream of mine. You know, I wanted to be educated. I wanted to become a police officer when I was a kid. You know, your interest changes as you grow up. Mm-hmm. And when I, wa- when I went to school at the age of seven, and then the, the, the headmaster of the school kicked me in the chest and said, get out of my school with some curse words. Mm-hmm. He said, people like you does not deserve to be educated or, or to live. Live your life as long as you can and get out of my school and never come within the perimeter. Mm-hmm. And... I sat there, all I had was a boxer. You know, I didn't have a pair of clothes to wear. And I sat there in the rain, starving. And I started working, you know. And it, when I found, that, found out that I was going to Canada, I didn't believe it. It didn't seem real to me. Yeah, what age did you come to Canada? I came when I was turning 15. Okay. So and really not, not that long ago. And, and I mean, in retrospect of everything, it really isn't that long ago. It's only been 10 years. And yeah. You know... I wanted people to respect me. I want people to think I'm a human being, respect me for what I do. Then you come here, you get investigated with federal federal investigators, then it tips me off. It makes mm-hmm. me, I cried, honestly, I'll be honest with you guys. Reasonably I so. cried because it's not easy. I don't want someone to pick on me because I'm Muslim. Right. I swear to God, if there was a non-Muslim person doing the same thing, they will never be questioned. For sure. Facts. And to me, I feel that I've been racially, racially discriminated yeah. and, and also religiously. But that, that's what we do, you know. Canadians we believe things and we stand against it. And, and as a Canadian, I'm, I'm going to continue to do that. And not the federal investigators, let whoever yeah. come. And my I mean, you're just going to give them the same answer every time. That's what I'm going to say. And it's available everywhere. Public information, yeah. literally. Pretty and, wild. And um, uh, at the end of the I Am Rohingya film, uh, the, the, there was a photo of uh, Faisal and and how he is currently pursuing uh, to be a police officer. Um, and as you said, like that's extremely inspiring. As um, Pat w- went to school to be a police officer, and uh, I could never do that line of work. And for someone to come from a situation like that and want to give back. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I tell everyone that that film was so difficult to watch and then to then get on stage and moderate a conversation. Um, it was very overwhelming for me. So that, that's incredible that you can do that uh, and you want to give back. Um, so thank you both for being true Canadians and, and really representing um, the adversity. Um, is there anything else that, that you would like to share with the, the people watching or, or, or anything of that nature? Any more experiences yeah, uh, even? I want mm-hmm. Faisal to ask something, then I'll say something before we close off. Sounds good. No, honestly, like especially the of the topic mm-hmm. of a Rohingya, we can talk about this all day, all night, and not going <coughs> anywhere. But what I want to say, but what I really want to say is that. What, ca- what caused this that all these people had to escape? You know, this isn't the first time, as Ahmed mentioned. Um, this happened 
for decades and my parent my parents escaped and they went back they were forced to go back to Burma in 1990s and they came back and they were and then they were gone again mm. and that's when I was born on the way middle, in the middle of um, genocides you know and like why is this happening why why is the world not didn't take any actions from the beginning why didn't why like especially the UN because UN has the UN has the like the power of the world to stop all these genocides and persecutions and everything why why no one has ever came forward and has stopped this from the beginning mm-hmm. and to to talk about like a school and stuff you know I, I I saw Ahmed growing up and I've seen I've seen him and his family you know we grow up together and I've seen him struggle and not not many not as many kids that I've seen a struggle and I we all struggle but like I, I, I went to school but I was we all we all were di- treated differently and at the school they didn't teach anything mm. and I had to go to private school and we had to we had to pay money from our own pockets and yet we didn't learn anything all I, all I know was out of all those eight years all I've learned was the alphabets of uh, the English that's it and for like especially for our parents and all all the other parents education is the most important thing you know like back in 1985 so when our citizens were taken away and then that's when we became we became Australians. And if you look if you look up the histories there was a lot of um, there were there were Rohingya people who were involved uh, in uh, politicians there were there were there were member of parliament uh, Rohingyas and then they slowly fired them and, they, and then they slowly slowly they took they took our citizenship away and then slowly the government of uh, Myanmar they promised that Muslim does not uh, I don't want any Muslims in this country and that's that is exactly what is happening right now you know there there are still a lot of Rohingyas people there's they're thinking to send all these Rohingyas back to Burma and yet the Rohingyas that are still living there they're still escaping from from the genocide and now well, like uh, what are what are we doing? What like why is these people escaping? When we're talking about these people to send them back, what's going on? Like uh, why why like what what is the what is the main point? Like why why aren't we getting the rights the basic rights what we need? Like as like what like what changed my mind to like become a police officer was that you know there's the country was uh, the the country is corrupted. You know, when I when I when I was growing up, I see a lot of people being mistreated, uh, especially when my parents talk about how they were being treated uh, as not human being, and and I was like, you know, this is not right. And I came here, and I and they I went to school. They teach us all the human basic rights, and then I was like, you know what? I'm, I want to go back and help all these people. You know, and this is the only way is to give back. And mm-hmm. uh, like uh, Rohingya, the, Rohingya, the documentary. This is not something that we had in mind. We had to do it. Is we had to do it because we had to get attention from the people because the people are not listening to us. Mm. You know, like, as I mentioned before, we 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 went to city halls. We went to Toronto, Montreal, Quebec, uh, parliaments. We're doing demonstration. No one was listening to us. You know, since this documentary. In just in one room, there's at least hundred people, more than hundred people. You know, there, uh, they, they at least ten of them take the story and go, uh, move forward. So, and this is this is this is why we uh, started this. You know, the only the only thing I want to say is that all these people does not want to go back until they have their basic rights. Mm. You know, the the three main rights Ahmed has mentioned: our citizenships, our own freedom just um safety. safety and why why can we not like get these three basic rights as a human being we all deserve to live in this world for sure right and i don't know what's stopping the un they they said as a genocide but they're not sure what uh, what they want to say like it's a fact that this is a genocide and they don't they don't want to mention it mm-hmm. like what's holding what's holding them back there's millions of people dying, uh, right as of as of we're talking right now. What, yeah. what like what's what's lacking? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, that's and, yeah. and to your point, 
and to Ahmed's earlier point about how people are still, I, I read an article about mental health of the Rohingya refugees. And one thing I found that was extremely fascinating was that most of the Rohingya refugees, when they reported on their mental health, they, they weren't struggling because they went through torture, because they went through starvation. They're, they're, they don't, they're not affected by what happened. All they they're want, they're used to it. And all they want is their freedoms. All they want is education. All they want is food. They're not worried about what happened. It's in fact, the, the data shows, yes, they remember it, but it's not bothering them. They just are so fixated on wanting the basic human rights. And if that doesn't provide you perspective, I don't know what yeah, does. It's, literally. It, and, and as I said, when I was introduced to Ahmed and, and ever since, it has extremely assisted my perspective. And I'm so thankful for everything. And I'm so, so thankful for you guys and for sharing your message. You know, one more thing is that, you know, all like... When the, when the people were escaping from uh, Burma to Bangladesh last year, all these uh, little girls, 11 years old, 12 years old, 13 years old, you, you name it, they were all raped and now they are giving birth. Mm -hmm. Who's going to take care of their children? Who's going to take care of them? Yeah. And, the, and, then there, and then there are a lot of, at least 100,000 orphan kids who's taking care of them. Yeah. You know, we gotta we got to come to the point and stop this immediately because this human being is just gonna die on a street without without even knowing mm -hmm. uh, noticing you know yeah. like and here even if, if uh, like a like a dog or a cat dies we know we still care for it it's uh we're just because they're not human being does not mean we should be mistreated and and here in bangladesh these are all human beings Mm -hmm. You know, they're being mistreated, they're being misguided, they're being uh, beaten up by police officers, by Bengalis and other, other police officers, and the war is not doing anything. Mm -hmm. Can I add one more thing? Sure. Yep. So, I went twice now since um, the crackdown happened. First time I went, it was just a week after 700,000 people fled in, into Bangladesh. You know, one thing that still I think about every single day, this kid about four years old said something to me, said to me, when I grow up, I just want to be like you, sir. And to me, I cried right in front of the child. I cried because I don't know what I am. I don't know what I'm worth. I don't know if I'm a good person or a bad person. I don't know any of that. You know why? I do good, my intentions are good, but I don't know if I'm actually doing good. You know, I don't know if my intentions are good, you know what I mean? To me, it could be good, but to other people, I don't know. So, you know, we don't have to wait for all this violence to happen here. You know, a lot of people will say, oh, it's too far. It's happening 15,000 kilometers away from us. But people don't realize one thing is violence is the fastest spreading thing in the world. It could spread faster than your dreams or, or faster than the internet. You know, today's their children, tomorrow it could be ours. And if we don't stand in their needs, and how can we expect them to stand in our needs? That's all. We should, we should be mindful of things. Everything doesn't stay where it is. And I promise you that someday we will need their help. Mm -hmm. Ahmed, Faisal, Pat, thank you so much for this conversation. I really, really appreciate you guys. Once again, uh, everyone, please visit rohingya.ca to learn more. Um, please reach out to both Ahmed and Faisal for more information. Two amazing, amazing people who continue to give back to the community, to give back to Canada, to give back to Rohingya on a daily basis and are a true model for, in my opinion, um, a modern day hero. So thank you both mm -hmm. so, so much. And uh, I look forward to seeing your work and um, I look forward to seeing everything you guys do in the future. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to both of you for taking the time off your holiday. Of course. <laughs> to talk about this. Thank you. Thank you so much.